Hello, and welcome back to the Goat Cave Podcast. Today, episode 73, and our guest today is best known for his love of pool riding. And after riding his first pool back in 2002, he was hooked. Since then, he has rode well over 100 backyard pools and published a book called You Won't, a way to document his adventures while riding pools. And most recently, he put out a micro documentary called Pool Service Announcement that would go on to the uh, Oregon Film Festival and would actually win a few awards. So, you know, I think it's pretty clear that our guest today, uh, Dean Dixon, is the pool dad. Dean, how are you? Dean I'm Dickinson. Great. Sorry. There we go. I knew I was going <laughs> to no, mess that up too. <laughs> no worries. I've been dealing with it my whole life and no hard feelings at all. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So uh, right away, if you guys are watching the video, you'll see that Dean is uh, in a cast at the moment. So what happened there? So a couple of weeks back, or at least now a couple of months back, uh, I was out riding some pools. We had a permission pool going at the time, and I was with my buddy TJ. He's a skateboarder. And uh, we had an exclusive invite uh, to ride this pool, but we only had, you know, I think about 45 minutes to ride. And uh, at the pool, there was an amazing slide that kind of dipped and dropped into the pool. And it was something that I kind of eyed up for a while um, as far as the roll-in goes. I've done a couple other ones that have successfully worked out. Um, so I climbed up there. It was pretty narrow, and the, the turn into the pool was super quick. We were a little pressed on time. Uh, my buddy Bryce Knights was there shooting photos, and he's an incredible photographer, skate photographer. So I was really wanting to connect and collaborate with him. And uh, gave it a go and it didn't quite work out. And you know, that's how, that's how it goes. So, um, took a slam, I broke my elbow. And then, um, following that I had multiple surgeries and complications. It's, it's kind of a long story, but I'm sure we'll get to it at some point. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, I hope that, you know, you're healing up real well. I know that yesterday you went into surgery, so good to hear that, uh, you know, you're getting everything repaired. And I know with the States, you know, I've said it a couple times on the show, it's not cheap. So, uh, you know, I hope that uh, everything's good there. Um, anyways, what we typically do here is we'll go way back to when you first started riding um, and move on from there. So, Dean, tell us about how you got into riding. Yeah, I feel like I'm probably the last generation to be able to share this story. Uh, growing up, my uncle was a huge influence on me. He was a motorcycle fanatic, and uh, I was probably five or six years old. He played Evil Knievel's Greatest Hits. And then Evil Knievel's Greatest Hits, it showed all of his land, all of his makes and all of his slams. And uh, I was just completely blown away, you know, larger than life figure, one of the greatest public speakers on the planet and uh, his business savvy, everything there was. He was unlike anyone else. And so after watching that, it just blew me away. So the second I went home, I played it again and then I started building jumps out in front of the house. And ever since then, I've been hooked. And then and then around that same time, too, you know, Pee Wee Herman was actually my kind of introduction to bikes as well. And uh, watching Big Adventure and, and the show. Uh, so collectively enough, Evil Knievel and uh, Pee Wee Herman were probably some of my biggest influences growing up, which is completely different than how kids are introduced to bikes now. Yeah, absolutely. It's such an interesting story. You know, I've done 72 episodes before this one, obviously. And for the most part, it's all pretty similar, right? Like a person will get a bike when they're younger, they'll start doing small jumps and whatnot. But it's really cool to hear your story, especially since you were, you know, so inspired by Knievel as well as Pee Wee Herman. And I think, you know, anybody that knows who you are, knows your love of Pee Wee Herman. Um <laughs> and it's awesome. I love it, man. There's so many great clips of you like riding in the outfit or even in uh, your most recent film, um, pool service announcement, you actually had a few clips there where you're dressed up as him. I love it. It's such a great, uh, little thing, you know? Yeah, it's been a blast. You know, uh, for me, I was lucky enough to have heroes and people that I looked up to and paying tribute to the people and the experiences that you have that make you who you are. And so, uh, I always try and Anytime I get a chance, I give a shout out to Evil Knievel. And I, I've never personally met him, but he had such a huge impact on me. And I even actually just watched Greatest Hits last night. And I hadn't seen it probably at least 10 years, maybe 10, 15 years. And it just brought me back. And I was like, yeah, this is why I am the way I am because of watching this. And it made such a big impression on me. So, um, yeah, I, I hope kids experience that. I, I think they do, but there's so much static and so much so many distractions nowadays, it's hard to just focus. But you know, when you grow up on the other side of the tracks and have the do it yourself mentality, 
I think I was just drawn to that that culture, and I'm I'm very fortunate to have had those experiences. Hell yeah, man! Um, so why don't we talk about the first bike that you ever had? Like first real BMX bike? Uh, yeah. Uh, growing up, my sister had a bike, and I was think- I-, I didn't get started till I was a little bit later. So five or six years old, I learned how to ride um, in our backyard on my sister's bike. And uh, she didn't ride it a whole lot. So she taught me in the backyard. I was barefoot in, in the grass in the backyard. And uh, I was learning on a girl's bike. And then my parents knew that I enjoyed riding the bike. And obviously, and then pretty much right after that, I started building jumps out in the front. It all kind of collectively came together all at once. And so they stripped the bike and painted it. It was a girl's bike. So obviously it had the top tube. So then girls could obviously step over wearing a dress or whatever. And so uh, they they painted it red, and then we would go up to Washougal Motocross um, and watch dirt bikes and, and motorbikes. And so I had a ton of stickers, so, and then we put a flag on the back of it. And uh, that was my first bike. I have no idea what brand it was. It was probably, a, at the time, a Kmart bike. And uh, they painted it, and we we worked with what we had, and, and that's what essentially my first bike was. Hell yeah, man. It's so cool to see that, like, how far you can really come, especially just from those days. Right. Um, and you had mentioned there, you know, and obviously you've been inspired by motocross with evil Knievel and then you going to the track and whatnot. Did you actually ever get into any motocross racing or not really? Not entirely. So when I was about nine, 10 years old, um, my dad and my grandpa surprised me with a, a Honda 70 mini bike. And, uh, I think that, that day on Christmas morning, my sister fired up the bike right in the living room, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> and uh, we ripped around that all throughout the neighborhood and, and got so many wrecks and the cops called. And it was awesome because we we lived, like I said before, we lived on the other side of the tracks in a place called Fruit Valley. Fruit Valley is in Vancouver, Washington, just outside of Portland. And uh, it's really isolated. And, and a lot of times you're just kind of off the beaten path on your own. And so that gave us an avenue to, to do what we did. And we would just burn out in people's front yards and their driveways. And it was amazing. You know, we, we, if you did that nowadays, like you'd have neighborhood associations after you and CPS would be called and they would be something completely different. So I didn't necessarily race or ride like traditional, traditional, like we would go to my uncle Dan's and ride some of his dirt bikes. That was pretty early on. And a lot of my buddies now transition from BMX to uh, riding vintage motocross and some of the street bikes. But uh, yeah, I don't really have a motorcycle, like a traditional motorcycle, motorcycle background, but we rode mini bikes and some dirt bikes growing up and it was awesome. And and I think eventually I'll definitely go that route, but I'm still having so much fun with BMX and my body's still holding up. So I'll, I'll juice this and, and ride it out as long as I can. But when I feel like my body's at a point to where, you know, I need a little um, I need a little extra help. I'll, I'll definitely get into dirt bikes and motorcycles. Hell yeah, man. Um, one of the things that, you know, you can't do on a motocross bike obviously is ride a pool. Like there's so many different things that come from BMX. And I think that that's, what's so great about it. Right? Like I have a lot of friends that are into motocross and whatnot. Um, some amazing motocross riders like, right. And they also transition at BMX as well, but there's just so many different things that like, about riding bmx right you can ride all the smaller stuff you can still hit big stuff if you're like burns and those guys you know um but yeah i think motocross is like i got into like just you know mini bike riding kind of like you there um years ago and that was like i think kind of my transition into bmx because i had already started um sort of riding around then but not really taking it seriously. And then I ended up moving away into a city. So I no longer was able to keep that bike and got into BMX from there. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, that, that's the neat thing about skateboarding, bike riding, surfing action sports. If you want to call it, that is it's so like-minded that you can, you can pick up the bike and come back to it. And it's, it's always there. If it's in your spirit, it's if it's in your heart, nine times out of 10, it is it'll always be a part of you and, and however you come back to it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when you actually started to get really into BMX, who were, uh, some of the riders that you looked up to at the time, were they mainly locals? Do you have a lot of pros that you were into? It's a great question. Looking back, my first BMX video that I ever watched was uh, thunder 
it was a, a ride published, the first ride published video. I think it was 97, 98. And in that video, it had some of the best trail riding from PA. And then it had some of the sickest street riding as well. It was actually a really well-documented video because it covered so many different scenes. It covered Salt Lake City and it covered just all over the country. And so for that time being, I didn't, there was, it was a mixed video. It wasn't like sections nowadays, you know, you have your opener and you have this monumental video part. Um, but my second video I actually watched was Ride On, and I was really drawn to Eddie Roman during that time, just all of his foot plant variations and doing tree rides. And growing up in the Pacific Northwest, we had trees everywhere. And uh, he was a huge influence on me. And TJ Lavin, you know, won the X Games in, I think, like, 97, 98, somewhere in there. And uh, that was really exciting. And then as I started to get a little bit older, obviously Dave Young, Jimmy LeVan, um, you know, obviously Matt Hoffman. And then, and then once I start transitioning to pool riding, Sean Fish Hoskins has probably um, been the biggest influence on me as far as like the style of riding that I do. And then, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have grown up when I did uh, to, to experience those guys in their heyday. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned rides thunder video there and that video was so rad, you know, like, uh, we recently talked to Matt Beringer and he had mm -hmm. some clips in it, obviously. Right. Like, like you had mentioned, uh, they had came to salt Lake and done kind of a little scene video there as well. And I kind of miss those days, right? Like if you know anything about me, I've been a huge fan of props for years, right? It's really influenced kind of where I want to go with things and what I like to do when it comes to BMX media and whatnot. And those videos, man, like, you know, even road fools, any of those videos just felt so cool because it was like, you know, bringing a bunch of people together and then riding rather than like, I don't know, whenever you go and film like full length videos, you know, I've filmed two and it's kind of a different thing, you know, at least the way that it comes out at the end of the day, I think. Um, those like scene videos where you see more of like the community is way cooler in my mind. And I wish that we would start doing that more now, but, uh, I get it, man. It's hard to do that. Like realistically, it's easier to film some sort of video where you're working with like a crew, you know? Yeah, it's tough. Making videos is a labor of love for even some of the biggest budget projects. And I think nowadays it's easier for riders and brands to get in, involved with a video project, which is awesome. And it creates a really great opportunity for them. But I think when you see an organic video um, and a, a lot of the, the props videos and road fools and it, it captured the scene. When I was a kid, I knew I wasn't going to be the greatest bike rider. But I, I understood that there was a scene and, and a sense of community and antics and wild, fun stuff. And that, that's what I was drawn into because I had the evil can evil send it mentality. I'm like, yeah, I might not pull it, but I'm going to have a fun time and, and a good laugh out of it. And I think that's what's always drawn me to BMX, the, the pure raw rawness to it, really. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what's really interesting is the fact that, you know, you were so inspired by that ride video and then, you know, only a few years would go by and you would actually be an intern for ride BMX and would be helping them work on their newest project insight. Um, so, you know, right away, I think what's so cool is that you actually had the opportunity to be an intern for them. Um, and you know, it ended up, uh, working out with your college courses and whatnot for what you were doing. Correct. And, um, yeah. How did that even come up? Like, it's just such a cool, uh, opportunity. Yeah. I'm very fortunate for the time and the place and just all the stars aligned together. So during that time, I moved to Southern California to go to film school growing up in the Pacific Northwest. I love it here. But during that time I was really getting sick and tired of the rain. And I knew that film and video production was something that I wanted to continue my education. So I went to film school down there. I was living with, a. Kurt Rasmussen. I don't know if you're aware of him, but um, Kurt and his family were, so, I'm so fortunate for them to give me the space and opportunity. I rented a room out of their house and they were just so welcoming to me. And uh, during that time, Ryan Navazio actually moved out uh, west to Southern California. And we were both uh, looking to get hired through um, a creative agency. And uh, God, I can't remember the name of it. I know it's going to come to me here in a few. But anyway, we're, we were, we met through a freelance gig and then, uh, collectively through his work, uh, he was doing stuff for Red Bull and just 
flying guys out from the East Coast, and he was working on his left-right video, and I think he just finished some standpoint projects. Um, he got the gig for Ride Insight, and I was already filming with him so much as is, you know, hanging out with Dakota and uh, Kurt and a lot of the Southern California guys. And so I knew there was an opening and an opportunity that I could um, get someone to sign off for an internship. So I reached out to Nabaz and be like, hey, is there any way that I c we could partner up as far as I'm already filming with you. I'm already donating footage and and um, and collectively adding to to insight in the video. And he was like, "Yeah, this is this sounds great." So then they ran it by Z and then Keith Mulligan and uh, Ryan Fudger, and they're all totally cool with it. And it was incredible. It was such a great experience just to be able to collaborate with them and and work on a video that I still enjoy watching to this day. And you know, shooting with Chester and Dakota and a little bit of Kurt, Jared Washington, and Mike Brennan. Such an incredible crew, and going into the ride office here and there, and it, it was incredible. So I'm, I'm so lucky to have had that opportunity, because then that opened up other opportunities down the road. And Davey Watson, I totally forgot about Davey. You know, his footage is monumental. Some of the favorite, most favorite things that I've been a part of was, was that project. Yeah, it's such a like crazy project too, right? And like I was saying earlier, you know, when you get a team of riders, there's always like, you know, they're part of that team. But when it comes to ride or any of these videos that are coming from these big, you know, brand outlets uh, for media, you can kind of go really open with it. You don't have to stick with just who's on the team. Um, you can kind of, you know, bring in a bunch of people. And uh, like you were saying, you know, that is kind of when Dak was really starting to pop off, I think. Like he was really becoming pretty popular around there. People were really starting to see kind of uh, how great of a rider he was, you know, um, and is obviously like Dak is within the top five, like ever in my mind. You know, when I think of the top five riders, he's in there. Um, yeah, I agree. His effortless style and and pure raw aggression. Um, aggro style of riding is just incredible he has such a good eye for setups and spots it's it's pretty awesome to ride with him because everywhere you go you're you're kind of connecting the dots and and finding setups and i i think he probably has some of the best eye for setups which is pretty pretty fun to document and 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 watch really yeah absolutely um so with that project you know you were doing uh I would say a good portion of the filming with Ryan, obviously, um, you know, Ryan was definitely the lead there. Um, but yeah, that's just such a rad opportunity for you. And you had mentioned that it had brought so many other things. What do you think directly came from that? Like right away, the thing that I think about is like, you know, when you look at your like BMX quote unquote resume, you've got one of the biggest companies in BMX on there, which is awesome, you know? Yeah, it was great. Uh, from that point, um, so I finished school. I, I finished film school in Southern California in 2007, and then I actually moved back up to Portland. And uh, during that summer, I just kind of reconnected with a bunch of friends here. And um, but I was still going down to California quite a bit. And uh, shortly after, um, I got entered, or I was already friends with Larry Alvarado, and uh, he was doing some freelance stuff with ESPN for their action sports webpage. And that was before it kind of merged with the X games and, um, Cody York at the time being was doing a lot of work with them. And I was freelancing with, you uh, low tech and a couple other brands and he liked my work and he knew I was in the, the Pacific Northwest area and they didn't really have anyone up here to kind of document some of the events. And the scene was really popping off in Portland during that time. And, uh, so that was, I was kind of their go-to guy and that was a huge part of, of my work and my grind was, uh, submitting and, and contributing to the action sports webpage for ESPN. And, uh, that was awesome. I did that for five or so years. And that was, that was majority of my work while I worked on my own personal projects and then collaborated with other brands. And, uh, that was incredible. I'm, I'm so fortunate. And then Brian Tunney ended up, um, kind of taking over that position and, and Tunney and I are friends and are, are still friends to this day and still connect. And it's, um, I'm very fortunate for it all. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's wild, man. It really is like interesting to see how far you can really go when it comes to, uh, like media within BMX and whatnot. Right. Like I know for any filmer out there, you know, we've all had that dream and to talk to people that have been able to go that far is so cool, especially because, 
you know, right off the bat, I want to say that out of anybody, like you definitely deserve to have the positions that you did. You put in so much work. And what I love too is that, uh, you know, BMX is kind of weird in a way where sometimes people aren't super professional, but you are like super professional with things, which is really cool. You know, like I think that's just part of it being that you are a school teacher as well, right? Like, um, yeah, I think that definitely has to play into that a bit. Yeah. And I've obviously grown up, you know, I've obviously matured, you know, there was things that I did when I was a teenager in my early twenties. I was like, ah, that probably wasn't the best way to go about, but you know, you live and you learn if you live long enough. And I'm lucky to have had those experiences, good and bad, you know, if I'm taking a slam on my bike or, um, whatever that may be. And the beautiful thing about production is you're constantly adapting and you're constantly being thrown challenges and variables that go against you. And uh, that's probably why I enjoy teaching so much or event production or film production is because it's, you're constantly on your feet. You're constantly rolling, rolling with the punches and, and doing the best with what you have for the time being. And then having time to evaluate your, your performance, I guess, in a way. And uh, yeah, but collectively I've, I've learned a lot and I'm lucky to have had so many great mentors like Navaz and, and Justin Cosman. I did a lot of work with Justin Cosman and he was an incredible mentor for me in, I guess, the BMX industry, as well as my own professional avenue as of teaching. So I'm, I'm just very grateful for it all. Yeah. So when did you go to school to become a teacher? Was that kind of the thing that you had thought about right out of the gate? Was this something that, you know, you kind of stumbled on or was it something you had always kind of pushed towards? I never thought I'd become a teacher. Uh, I hated high school probably more than anyone I know. And I actually share that with my students quite a bit. I was lucky enough to have, it, it's strange because I had great experiences, but as far as the dynamic of the high school setting, I wasn't really very interested at all. Um, my senior year in high school, all my friends were seniors. And then once they graduated, I was just like, okay, like there's nothing really here for me, but we had an incredible video production program. And, uh, my parents got me a high eight millimeter camera uh, for Christmas one year. And then as I started to build my skill set and understanding, we had an incredible studio and we would do live to tape um, news style um, productions. And then I was doing bike stuff. Um, my grandmother helped me buy a VX 2000 and, and that just changed my life forever. You know, I was already heading in that direction. I was already really drawn to video production. Um, but with that program and their support really just like catapulted, my my interest in in my education so i've always been drawn to to photo and video production and and i've been freelancing i still freelance to this day and um i guess what what pushed me in that direction was when i moved to texas i started working for the school district down there the austin independent school district and i worked at a school for children with multiple disabilities and um as i was doing that work i was like man I really enjoy this work. That is, this is very meaningful. How can I continue this avenue? I, I want to be able to, to live my lifestyle and freelance. How can I make a little bit more money and, and think about longevity? So I started looking at all my options. And um, during that time, I was actually talking to my video production teacher. And uh, he was like, well, I'm looking to retire here in a couple of years. Uh, it, it would be great to pass this, this gig off to you. You obviously have all the industry experience and know-how and you're already working for a school district, You, this would be a great transition. And at that point, I was so happy and I was so stoked living in Austin and freelancing with transmission events with Fun 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 Fest. And I, I just recently did Texas Toast and I, I felt like I was in a very comfortable space, but I knew I wanted something more and I knew I was capable of more. And so right then and there, I was just like, you know what, I, I think I'm gonna go back and get my teaching certification and so, and I knew I wouldn't be able to do it in Austin because there's way too many distractions. Austin's incredible, but as far as going back to school, I don't know if it would have been the best place for me because every night there's live music and Nine Street Trails is always going off and House Park and, and all my friends are there and it, it would be really hard to, to focus. So I knew I had to move back here to get my teaching certification back to Portland and, and focus. And that's what I did. And I ended up getting a teaching cert um, my teaching certification as well as a full-time gig, uh, pretty quickly. And, uh, I'm glad that I went that route. Yeah. It's, uh, always really cool to hear from people who are teachers or have like, 
you know, professional jobs within BMX. There's actually a few people that are like doctors around here. Like, you know, there's a shop that I used to work at and there was a mountain bike guy who's a surgeon and like, Mm -hmm. you know, he goes and does his surgeries all day and then leaves and goes and rides his mountain bike for the rest of the night. And it's just always really cool to hear those kind of jobs, you know? Um, But I think what's so cool is the fact that with teaching, you know, I had kind of the same thing where in high school, I hated it. I went to, you know, when I was growing up, I had a really hard time in elementary school and I was diagnosed with a learning disability and I just couldn't pay attention. I had all these things that I just wasn't able to do and I hated school since day one. And then uh, I decided that, you know, the household that I was living in at the time wasn't the greatest um, and I just really wasn't about it. And then in uh, grade nine and 10, I actually went away to a boarding school and that like changed everything. You know, my grades went from like just barely passing to top of the class. And then when I left, they went all the way back down again. And I think it was just one of those things that like, if you're fully willing to immerse yourself in it, you can get really far with it. And I think that, uh, that was a good choice for you to move back to Portland because had you stayed in Austin, it definitely would have affected, you know, the way that things are. Yeah, I agree. It probably would have taken me three to four times longer. And honestly, I wanted to be closer to my family. I have a better relationship with my family more than ever. Uh, and I think that was a huge part of coming back. And, and, and obviously, I miss Austin. Austin's one of the most incredible places I've ever lived and, and been a part of. But I can always visit and go back, and I still do. And, uh, but it's a huge part of my spirit. So here's a question for you. When, you know, you started to become a teacher and whatnot, uh, you know, obviously you're a pretty big name in the BMX world. Um, how did that kind of transition? Because, you know, obviously you're still very into BMX. You still ride, you ride pools all the time, which is like one of those things that I don't know, even when I was in public school and I barely knew about BMX stuff, I always wanted to go and see people skate a pool, ride a pool. (laughs) Have any of your students ever kind of figured this out or anything like that? Not really. I don't know. I I don't think they they really care to tell you the truth, to be honest. And and that's fine by me. I'm not I'm not looking for any recognition or uh, it, it's a great segue to connect with a kid if they're interested in skateboarding. Even scooters, like I'm not one to be anti scooters if anything. I would say a large percent of my percentage of my students spend a lot of time on their phones and don't really actively do a whole lot. So I actually connect more with some of the scooter kids because they're outside and enjoying um, the great outdoors and, and doing something physically active. And so I'm very uh, an inclusive uh, educator as well as just my mindset as far as quote unquote extreme sports, if you want to call it that. Um, but yeah, I guess a couple of them have, have kind of found some of projects that I've been a part of or, or come across some of my work and And they do get stoked. It's weird because it's so hard to assess and evaluate if kids are into something or not, um, just where they're at developmentally. And that's totally fine. Um, But years later, I always I'll I'll have kids email me or or come back and talk about certain things. And it's funny to see that. But uh, but yeah, I think some of them once once they do kind of get it or see some of the projects and And, uh, and that's neat in any way you can connect with a kid. I I really try my hardest to, to make a connection because that's what life and education is all about. Yeah, that's, uh, that's so rad, man. I wish that some of my teachers were into cool, you know, stuff like that. Like I would have connected so much better with them had they had a history of skateboarding, BMX, anything like that. Like when I was in boarding school, Um, you know, obviously you're living there and, uh, you have like counselors who kind of take care of you throughout the week. And then you'll go home on the weekends. My counselor Reed was actually a a skater beforehand. And that was really cool because we were able to really get along and talk and do that stuff. And there was a few times that, you know, you didn't get to leave the campus very often, but yeah, he let me go and ride sometimes, which is really cool. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, Yeah. Any way to connect. It's uh, I feel like it's a challenge more than ever just with devices and social media and TikTok and just how fast things are moving. It, it keeps people hunkered down. It keeps people very antisocial and isolated when in a sense we have every resource on the planet to, to feel unity and and connect. Um, it is really hard to to connect with people nowadays. So I, I think it's awesome that you had that experience and being able to 
to connect on that wavelength. Yeah, and even when I was in high school, you know, cell phones were a thing, but smartphones had just started to become popular, right? So I guess I'm kind of lucky that I was born when I was because, yeah, I feel like I would have uh, had a way harder time like with, you know, cell phones and whatnot. And there was a, a couple of years there where in our scene here in uh, like Kitchener, Waterloo, we're about an hour from Toronto. Um, but there was a couple of ye- like couple of years that we really didn't have any new riders come along. And I kind of wonder if it was, you know, the rise of uh, smartphones and people just sticking on their phones and whatnot. Do you think that that's kind of played any, uh, like had any play into like more recent riders? A hundred percent. I feel like nowadays everything is conveniently accessible in your own home. If it's Uber Eats, if it's Netflix, if it's YouTube, if it's social media, um, you know, entrepreneurs, it's just everything is collectively available at your fingertips. So in a lot of ways, people, they don't leave home there. And even with COVID, it's just like, I feel like a lot of people are already recluse and isolated uh, which I have a hard time connecting with because any chance I get, I'm on the road, I'm traveling, I'm seeking out bulls, I'm outside. And so uh, I think that's definitely hindered some of those opportunities for, for the youth to get into BMX. But at the same time, I was just having a conversation with my friend. Um, COVID has actually created some opportunities for people to kind of hit the reset button and realize like, wow, I need to go outside. Wow. I need to ride my bike. Like I can't go to rock concerts or I can't do the normal things that I'm used to, but I can go out to the trails. I can go ride street. I can go cruise around the neighborhood. And so I'm actually stoked in a sense that those opportunities and society has kind of changed and adapt to see the importance of, of recreation. Yeah, I wonder uh I wonder how that's going to come into play for people in the future, right? Like with this year, we did see a huge rise in bicycle sales at least in Canada. I don't know about you guys, but every mm-hmm. bike shop here was sold out. Like, you know, there were so many bike shops that literally had no stock, which is insane. That's so good to hear, you know, especially for this industry. Yeah, I agree. In a lot of ways, I hope the the bicycle industry can use this as um something to learn from uh and how to connect the the family unit as well as um our significant others and i in a way i think it's exciting i I think it's exciting that there's this new interest in in cycling if it's you know the the coaster bikes for the little balance bikes for kids or if it's e-bikes i i think it's awesome i think anyone that's on wheels is doing something right Yeah, definitely. Um, And while we're on the topic of wheels, so I found an old, uh, I believe it was an interview with you talking about, you know, when you had first got into riding and whatnot and how people were uh, like skaters were so different when it came to BMX riders. You know, I feel like nowadays we definitely see that everybody kind of gets along, but uh, there's still, you know, a few bad in the bunch. Um, you know, what was your initial thoughts about skaters kind of gatekeeping skate parks and making it like so aggressive towards bikes? To me, it's always been such a weird thing. And like, it's just so dumb to me, considering that it's like, we're all doing it for the same reason. You know, at the end of the day, we can all sit here and ride this pool and have a good time, right? Yeah, growing up, I thought it was completely ridiculous, and I still think it's ridiculous. So I came from team sports. I played baseball, basketball, wrestling, and swimming, and and a ton of other sports. So I was very active. And what drew me in about BMX was it it was a sense of community. You know, you're kind of going against the grain. You're you're doing your own thing. The do-it-yourself spirit was something that I was really drawn to. And then we had a skate park that was built right around when I was starting to starting to ride BMX and they were very anti-bike, you know, some of the worst things I've ever seen have experienced at that park. You know, there's been hate crimes, there's been murder, there's been rape and it's, it's terrible. It's absolutely just, it's disgusting to tell you the truth. And so when I was experiencing those things, it just made me think like, how petty is this? You're on four wheels. I'm on two wheels. And, uh, and growing up, we would ride Burnside as well. And we understood Burnside was its own 
beautiful thing and and it still is and i really admire all the work that has been done there so i i understood that to an extent we were guests because that was a hundred percent built by skateboarders advocated by skateboarders and and i admire the work that's been done there and i'm friends with some of the guys that have continue to build there or were a part of the the initial first build and so for me right around that time i started riding backyard pools and it, it, it would be hilarious because i'd be at a skate park and people would be yelling and screaming at us, throwing their boards at us. And then I'd be like, okay, well, I'm just going to go and ride the real thing. I'm going to go and ride backyard pools. Because in a sense, a skate park is emulating what a backyard pool is. And so I was just like, why don't I just ride the real thing? You know, you guys can fight over your fun boxes and your quarter pipes and whatever that is. I'm actually going to ride something even better, and I'm going to do it on my own. And uh, so from right then and there, I, I really focused my efforts on finding and seeking out backyard pools and you know living in the northern states and, and northern like yourself you understand that there isn't a whole lot of backyard pools in the pacific northwest and other northern locations but that didn't keep me away from seeking them out and during that time we rode like 10 or so pools in those first couple of years in, in my hometown vancouver washington and that's unreal you know i still drive by those locations and think like this is incredible. This is before GPS. This is before, you know, the real estate websites like Zillow and seeking these resources, these pools out and using these resources. So uh, for me, I was just like, well, you know, you guys can fight over your, your public skate park. We're going to go and ride this backyard pool. And so in a lot of ways, some of the, the skaters did kind of would start to see that we were, we were going that path and we're like, oh, maybe these guys aren't so bad. And then, and now I'm, friends most of the people i ride with are skateboarders now yeah i was gonna say you know when uh you released a uh, pool service announcement you know a lot of the footage in there is of uh bmx riders but just the other day you had actually released the extras and 90 percent of that footage is skaters which is so cool to see you know i love the fact that uh you know everybody's kind of getting along and it is one of those things that i've had it a few times where it's you know been rude uh, skaters with gatekeeping stuff. And I always find it interesting because it always seems to be skaters, you know, like I feel like most skaters can show up to a park and no BMX guy is going to be like, Hey man, fuck you. Get out of here. You can't be here. Like we just don't do that, you know? Um, but obviously I'm not speaking for all of BMX. I'm sure there's a few shitheads out there, but, uh, yeah, when it comes to Burnside, like you had mentioned, you know, for anybody that doesn't know what Burnside is, you are living under a rock because that place is massive and it is probably the oldest DIY park um, potentially ever. But it is very old, almost, I believe, either just past 30 or is about to pass 30 years old. Um, and that place is incredible, man. Like, that has always been a dream for me. I'm going to ride that park one day and I fully intend to, you know, respect everything that's there because it is incredible to see what's gone on there, you know? Yeah. Burnside Skate Park, uh, they just celebrated their 30th year anniversary. That was uh, on Halloween. That's their birthday. And it's incredible to see what they have done there. And from that park, that was the seed because Grindline, Dreamland, um, Airspeed, and um, a couple other companies were born from that do-it-yourself project. And and once that park was built, then these guys started building skate parks all over the world. And they've built the best skate parks in the world. And it's been awesome because I've um, had the opportunity to collaborate with some of those construction companies. And then here in Portland, Oregon, I was on the skate park leadership advisory team in uh, 2004 and we advocated for 19 public skate parks in Portland. And I think they built seven so far, which is unreal. It was so hard to even comprehend that back then. And now it's just like, there's parks all over the place. And then, and then other cities are kind of starting to adapt some of the work that we did with that leadership program. And uh, it's been an incredible experience. So I'm very fortunate for the movement that Burnside created and and the ripple effect of our community and, and it's been great to to be a part of that process or at least sit in on some of those committees yeah definitely um you know there's quite a bit that goes into you know getting like new public parks and to anybody out there that's you know like yourself or anything like that that's trying and they're out there trying to make something happen props to you because it is difficult it's so hard to convince 
uh, council people that, you know, this is just as important as a baseball field. Like, it's so wild, right? Like, uh, around here, we've had quite a few parks built in the last 10 years, you know, but if you came to Kitchener 10 years ago, there would be one park and that's it. You know, like you might have one in Cambridge, which is the next like closest one. But now I think we have, I believe seven parks within a 30 minute radius of my house, which is awesome. Like so great, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. It, it definitely takes a village for any of those projects to be built. And, um, a lot of times it just comes down to building relationships, building a community. And then in a lot of ways, the city does see the opportunity for them to, to, to make that happen. Yeah, man. Um, anyways, a few minutes ago, you had mentioned, you know, that when you had felt that you were kind of being pushed away from certain parks, you would just go and ride pools instead. And obviously, you know, you are most known for riding pools. Like I think if anybody in the BMX world, like, you know, it's definitely you, Corey Walsh, those kind of guys, you know, but for you, it's definitely like you're the pool guy for sure. Um, but anyways, how did you start to find these pools and what was the, I know in 2002, you had went on a trip to a square pool with Mike Hoder, right? And that was the first one that you had rode. What, like, what really clicked then? It was the entire experience to tell you the truth. Uh, so Mike Hoder, had this pool going in West Seattle, actually really close to where Grindline Skate Parks is based. And um, we had to sneak through the broken chain lake fence. And then we jumped into this pool at a burnt down house and just the entire experience sneaking in, getting in there, and then just seeing a, a terrain that was never intended for people to skate or ride bikes and, and kind of visualizing what that whole space and that whole spread was like in its heyday. You know, did they have big blowout parties? Was it a, a college dorm? What it's so mysterious in so many different ways. And then just come and go like the wind and move on to the next. And, uh, that was a pretty incredible experience riding a backyard pool with some of my best friends in Seattle, Washington. And, uh, so for, from right then and there, I was like, this is what I'm doing. Cause Right after that, we went to a public skate park and kids were throwing their skateboards at us and telling us we couldn't ride. And it, it had like a pool coping bowl there. And I'm just like, this thing sucks in comparison to the pool that we just rode. Why don't we just ride what we want to ride? It's like it's like going to a skate park and riding a handrail and having someone screaming at you and, and kicking you out. And you're like, well, you know, I could just go to the park um, down the road from my neighborhood and ride the real thing. So I guess that was just my attitude. It'd be like, OK, you guys have fun with this. I'm going to go and seek out the real thing. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. You know, um, it is really funny when that happens, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, like people freaking out about it and freaking out about people riding the park because it is, like you say, way better just to go and ride the real thing anyways. You're probably going to have less of a hassle, like in reality, you know. Um, and I've always kind of felt that way with handrails at least. Like I love a good handrail and – uh you know, I've never really messed around with too many park rails just because it's not the real thing, at least in my mind. Like if I'm going to a skate park, I'm going to ride the things that I can't find in, you know, the general public, like not at the park. Um, yeah. And that's kind of something that like I see that a lot now where a lot of the skaters advocate for parks that are very plaza oriented and whatnot. And I kind of always think I'm like, why aren't you trying to get something that we do not have, right? Like get something that nobody has around here because we need that. Like we already have a thousand ledges. Like we can go and ride any one of those ledges. We don't need one, another one here, at least in my opinion. But yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a shift as far as the mindset goes, because I feel like I came from an era to where everyone was such purist. If it was trails or if it was street or a vert ramp, you know, it's just back then people were hardcore about about what they do. And now it's I love the skate parks and I love the street pauses. But at the same time, like I, I want to jump down a real handrail. I, I grew up riding street, so I've always had that uh, mentality. And I think that's why I transitioned so well into riding backyard pools. Cause it's, it's street riding, you know, you're out on the streets, you're looking out for pools. The terrain isn't necessarily like quote unquote street riding, but, um, as far as seeking the spots out, getting them going, it, it feels like just cruising the city, which is pretty, pretty exciting to me. 
Yeah, it's definitely, uh, you know, I look at pools as like the original street riding in my mind because realistically, like, you know, I get riding handrails and everything, but if I want to really go and find something, like, I think that a pool is kind of the, like, cream of the crop, the greatest thing that you can ride street, you know? Like, a lot of people spend years trying to find pools to ride and whatnot, and they never get the chance. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about how, you know, people can try and find a pool. And obviously, first things first, you know, it's obviously illegal. Like, you know, you're trespassing at the end of the day. It's just like riding street, except, you know, instead of having a security guard come kick you out, you're probably going to have cops show up at some point, potentially. Um, so, yeah, what uh, what are some of the steps that you take to trying to find a pool that's kind of in a good, safe area, um, anything like that? There's so much that goes into it beyond what people, most people could even comprehend. It's just like evaluating your surroundings, you know, looking at the times that are, that are appropriate to try and sneak into some of these spots. And, uh, I absolutely love the entire process about it all. Uh, growing up, I did a lot of fishing with my dad and it felt very similar because some of the areas that we would go and fish, we'd have to sneak in. My dad would downshift and go around the park gate we would get there before everyone else and and it was incredible so i took that spirit to pool riding and now it's easier more than ever just with with google maps and the real estate websites and uh, even social media it's just like it, it, if you haven't found a pool yet and you're in a location that actually has pools you're kind of blown it or you just don't care you know and and for me i just feel like it's easier now than ever so in a lot of ways it's just when we were kids, we would just drive down alleyways and, and look over fences and, and cruise around on our bikes. And now a, a lot of it's Google Maps and, and understanding and knowing an area, you know, is there gangs here? Is there a neighborhood watch? It, because it, it is sketchy. You're trespassing and sometimes you're on people's property. And with COVID and, and uh, civil rights movements going on right now, people are, the tensions are high. You got to be really, really careful for, for what we're doing. And um, in a lot of ways, just being honest with people too. You know, over the summer, I knocked on a lot of doors to seek out permission. And I would say a third of the time, we actually got permission to clean out and ride a lot of these pools. Um, but I think just presenting yourself and being honest, you know, when I was younger, I would make up all sorts of weird stories. Like I'm looking for my cat and this and that. And now I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to be honest. I'm going to be transparent. Let them know what I do. And, and it, it's worked. And so if, if you're okay with re rejection, knocking on doors does, can really help. Yeah, absolutely. I think the way that you go about it now is so great too, because at the end of the day, like if the person gives you permission, that's so much better. Like, you know, realistically, if someone doesn't want to use their pool anymore, it's probably filled with water. It's probably disgusting. You know, the last thing they want to do is have to actually deal with this. It's probably been a headache for them for months. And now all of a sudden someone comes along. Hey, I want to volunteer to clean out your pool so that I can come back here and ride it. Like, you know, I'm not going to try and do this while you're not home. I just really would like to do this. If you're interested, then let me know. And that's awesome that people actually are cool enough to let that happen, you know? I think, too, what helps is the fact that, you know, you actually have quite a few credentials under your belt when it comes to pool riding, right? Like, you've got a whole book that you had published about riding pools and then also um, your newest film. Like, I think if you start showing people that kind of stuff, they get probably pretty interested, you know? Yeah, I think it just starts to relationships and being transparent and connecting with people and... uh it's exciting. Like I've knocked on people's doors and then realized I met them 10, 15 years before that. And it, it's exciting. So I think just putting your best foot forward and if you want it, you'll, you'll seek it out. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's nerve wracking. You're soliciting, you're on someone's property. Uh, and, and I still enjoy riding barge pools, but I try to avoid it at all costs. But if a pool is really good, you know, you got to make it happen. And, uh, and sometimes that can get you in trouble, and that's just how it goes, just like street riding or anything else. Yeah, so while we're on the topic of trouble, would you mind telling us like of a situation that you kind of found yourself in? Yeah, I've, I've had a couple different situations, but I guess the one that really stands out is um, 
long story short, I, I learned how to swim in this pool, Marshall Center Pool in Vancouver, Washington. And even swimming as a kid, I remember feeling the transitions with my feet and my hands uh, before I even knew what skateboarding and bike riding was. And, um, and then when I was going to film school, I had heard that they had cleaned out and drained the pool and uh, Marshall Center was being renovated. And actually, a couple of my friends were already getting sessions in. I was like, I absolutely have to ride this pool. This is a pool that I learned how to swim in. I used to work at the community center. And so I flew up and on Christmas Eve, I think this was 2006, 2007, somewhere around then, uh, we got in there and we started riding it, had an awesome sesh. And I was there with a couple of buddies. And then uh, my buddy Alex looked up top and um, that was like where the viewing station was. And he saw some flashlights. And so from there, we're like, holy shit, we got to get out of here. So we ran to the back, the back fence, getting ready to hop the fence as we were leaving out of the pool. Uh, we saw three cop cars drive right by and we we're like, we're stuck. So we, we hit out there for probably 45 minutes. It felt like three hours just because, you know, we couldn't even, we couldn't make any noise whatsoever. And then they finally shined the light on us and we hopped over the fence. And the second I went over the fence, they, they threw me in cuffs. They started reading me my rights. They smashed my face up against the, the fence. And I was like, well, yeah, they're doing their job. They don't know what, what we're doing and, and we're trespassing. We shouldn't be here. We're, we're breaking the law. And um, we were honest. We told them what we were doing. They ended up letting us go, which was pretty incredible. Um, but I ended up having to pay a six hundred dollar fine, and I was on a year diversion. So I was, I was, um, so I, I I couldn't do anything criminally for a year, and then that was removed off my record. And uh, yeah, that was a wild experience. And then recently, I would say two years ago, I went to Vegas and I was riding some pools with Gary Owen. He is a legendary skateboarder. He's been skating pools for he's sixty. 60, 61 years old now. And, uh, he, I think he's been skating pools consistently, probably longer than almost anyone else. Um, this guy is, is incredible. And, and I was riding some pools with him and then my buddy, Matty, Matty Raddy came out to, uh, to, to Vegas as well. And we we're checking out pools on the strip and I hopped the fence, started riding this pool. And then this guy came out and, um, I didn't realize, but this was, um, it was some sort of shelter for veterans. And, um, the guy was just straight in my face and I, I thought he was going to swing at me and he was pretty much screaming at me. And, and he was a bigger guy too. And I just had my hands behind my back and I was very honest. I was very cool, calm and collected. And after about 45 minutes, I, I, I talked him down to not call the cops or, or detain me. And, uh, it was a pretty intense moment. You know, the guy, I uh, felt like we were disrespecting um, that facility for veterans. And I just said, thank you for your service. Thank you for, for what you guys do. And uh, I was able to, to kind of talk my way out of it. But that was probably one of the most intense. And then I've had, you know, some guys pull out guns and this and that. And I didn't feel as threatened as those times. But this time was 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 pretty intense. Yeah, it's definitely uh, one of those things that right away, right, you really got to do your research because – you know, who knows if you had gotten somebody way more aggressive than that guy, it could have ended very badly. Um, and I think what's good, too, is the fact that you are a very calm, cool, collected guy. Like, you know, you're really able to kind of use that to your advantage. I have a lot of friends who would make that situation way fucking worse, like way worse than it needs to be, you know. And uh, I'm always kind of the guy that tries to calm everybody down and half the time it just doesn't even work. So, um yeah, I guess, you know, yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, that whole situation is pretty scary to be in. Yeah, it can be. I think just keeping your cool and realizing we are trespassing, we are breaking the law. You know, of course, someone's going to be pissed. If someone jumped over my fence and was lingering in my backyard, yeah, I'm going to have some questions. And uh, and I realize that. And I every pool that I go into, I realize I'm I'm taking a chance. It's a risk. It's a gamble. And and property owners have every right to be pissed. And, and depending on where you are, when we were in Texas, that was something that I kept in mind as well. You know, people own guns in Texas and take a lot of pride in their their family and their their salvation. And so I've always kept that in mind. And I just try and be very honest and and upfront with people. And, and I feel like that's worked to my advantage. And if it doesn't work out, then you move on and, and check out the next pool. Or, or even if you are getting kicked out, 
be cool about it because they might actually give you permission. And I, and I've had that I've had cops catch me in pools and be like, yeah, I got a call and I'm just checking out, see what you guys are doing. I don't care about what you guys do, but just take a couple more laps and then you guys got to go. And, uh, and, and that's incredible. I've had some of the worst experiences with cops and I've had some of the best and I always keep that in mind. And I, I try not to make any judgment based on, on their job or property owners or anything else. Because if you're cool, calm, and collected, in a lot of ways, it, it, it can benefit the situation. Yeah, definitely. And when it comes to cops, obviously, you know, at the end of the day, they're doing their job. Like, that is their job, is to come and see what you're up to. And, yeah, um, it is really cool whenever you do get a cool cop about stuff, right? Like, we've had uh, numerous times where we're out filming, and, you know, like, they just don't have security at this building. So police get called. And half the time, they just come up and say, hey, like, you know keep doing what you're doing. We were just making sure that uh, everything's okay over here. And I think when it comes to pools too, most of the cops know that like, you know, when they show up, if you guys are out riding and whatnot, you're not doing drugs. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're not trying to steal or break anything. You guys are just having a good time. And in fact, you're probably keeping shitty people away. Like, at least that's the way that I look at it. Um, but yeah, I guess certain people just don't know that. It's unfortunate, but like BMX, skateboarding, that whole lifestyle gets a bad rap because of a few people. And there's always the stereotypes is a big thing as well, right? Um, but yeah. I agree. Um, yeah, anyways, so this past summer, you know, you were in Portland. Uh, what was it like trying to find and scope out pools with everything going on? Did you kind of just say, nope, not doing that? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So when COVID really hit, I was obviously very, very mindful and, and, and isolating myself just to make sure that I was doing my due diligence. And, uh, and then things slowly start to open up and I was out riding by myself, like a lot of other guys, you know, I think a lot of riders, BMXers kind of utilize this as to our advantage, as far as buildings being vacant, hotels being closed down, parks being closed down. Even, you know, um, in Austin, um, you know, the college is opening up to where you could ride all day. So, yeah, I, I used it to my advantage in a lot of ways. And, and once things kind of started to mellow out a bit um, during the summer, we started knocking on doors. And we were really hesitant in the beginning. I was. Uh, but my buddy TJ that I ride with all the time, he was finding so many pools. I was like, let's give it a go. Let's just see, see what, what, we, what we'll make of it. And we were wearing our masks and being mindful to the property owners. And I would say a third of the time they gave us access and they're like, we haven't left our houses. It's nice to see people outside like yourselves and watching us through the window and cheering us on. And that was an incredible experience. And, and over the summer, I went down to California twice and I spent like three weeks uh, the second time and just road tripping up and down Southern California and, and Northern California too. And this summer was one of the best summers I've had as far as riding pools. And then and then I en ended with a bang as far as my slam. And that's okay. And that's how it goes. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's all part of it, unfortunately. Sometimes you got to take a fall. Um, but yeah, so obviously over the summer, we did see the release of Pool Service Announcement, your newest uh, film. And I got to say, man, I was hooked the second that I watched this. Like, honestly, my genuine, honest opinion that that is definitely the best. BMX related uh, like content to come out this year, which really speaks volumes considering there was so many great you know videos to come out. Right? Um, wow! Thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. Definitely. Uh, when it comes to like short form or shorter form uh, videos, one of my favorites. Um, and even the last couple of days, like last night, you know, I woke up kind of really early this morning, um, and instantly I had one of the songs uh, from that like movie in my head and uh yeah just went and watched it again tried to make sure i had all my awesome questions for it so um yeah like i had mentioned in the intro i think i did um you actually spent two and a half years working on pool service announcement which is such a great amount of time you can really get a lot done um and especially when it comes to pool riding and what you guys are doing it's a little bit harder to film um especially since you know you do have to have permission sometimes and everything that's going on um but yeah, what inspired you to make this mini documentary? Obviously, we've seen the release of your book a few years beforehand, but um, what made you want to, you know, go into film with it? 
Yeah, first and foremost, thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate that. There has been so much incredible content. And for me, it's just, it's personalized projects. I don't really care if people get it or not or enjoy it, but I just like to document sessions with my friends and, and archive that because essentially I'm not going to live forever and backyard pool writing is not going to live forever either. So I think it's good to, to capture it now because a lot of these newer manufacturers, uh, pool making design build manufacturers don't make writable pools. So we should archive it and save it and preserve it in, in a way that will carry on beyond my years. Uh, so I guess what inspired me from the beginning, um, 2007, I released a, a mini pool writing documentary, uh, Take It or Leave It, with Low Tech, and I was very fortunate to have that opportunity. And I've always been drawn to you know, pools in general with the book and the documentary. And um, the last couple of years, I've been very focused with, with my job and my career and going back to school. And uh, I was actually at work and we got a, a, a donation and it was a Super 8 camera. And it was a 814 auto zoom, Canon auto zoom. And I picked it up and I just felt those emotions and that energy, just like I did when I was filming Take Her to Leave It and shooting Super 8 16 millimeter film during that time. And I was just like, I got to give this thing a go because essentially we couldn't use it for work. We didn't have the resources. We didn't have the budget to shoot a bunch of film and pay for processing and developing and, and scanning and all that. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do a camera test and see how it goes. And uh, I went out and did a camera test and the footage came out incredible. And from right then and there, and then right around that same time, I ended up watching, uh, coming back to some of the old drug, anti-drug PSAs as a kid during the Reagan administration. And that was the gal diving into the swimming pool, the empty swimming pool. And that commercial freaked me out so much as a kid. Uh, the way I comprehended it and articulated it was this gal was so high on drugs that she dove into a swimming pool. And I remember hearing stories of my parents talking about people high on psychedelics during that time and diving out of windows. And it, it, it freaked me. So I was like, well, how about I make a weird anti-drug PSA slash pool writing video and shoot it all on Super 8 and document these sessions. And I think too, lately I've been a little bit more drawn to film because anytime you've had files backed up or hard drives crash or footage being lost, it's gone forever. But if you have the actual negative and you have that in a can or you have that somewhere preserved, that will live so much longer than you know a MySpace account or, or photos that you have saved on a computer that then crashes or a program's obsolete anymore. And um, that was exciting. So collectively, I just wanted to document pool writing like I do with a Super 8 camera because when you're pulling that trigger, you have a sense of a, adrenaline because you don't know if it's going to work out or not. Because digital, we live in such a digital um, environment now to where it's so safe. Everything is so easy and so safe. But when you're shooting on film and, and you over or underexpose a roll of film, you're like, damn, that's a hundred bucks down the drain. Um, I'm never going to do that again, or I'm going to get a better light meter. And so I enjoy that. And I think pool riding translates in that same sense because everything you're doing is, is risk-taking and being in the moment. And, uh, and I think that's what draws me to pool riding in general is you are 110% in the moment because you're trying to get in and get out without anyone knowing and document the sesh and, and move on to the next. And uh, it's exciting. And so it, I, I felt like it was just a great time to do it. And I was able to travel internationally and go check out the guys in Sydney, Australia, Trent and Benny. And, um, you know, I went to LA and, um, all Vegas and all over the Northwest. And, uh, I was trying to get up to Vancouver, BC, Canada, because a year or two before that, the pool scene was really popping off with, uh, Corey Walsh and Josh and, and some of the guys up there. But, um, some of those guys kind of took off. And then to my understanding, um, some of the Canadian government has changed as far as international, um, real estate, as far as international buyers buying real estate, and they're unable to keep those properties vacant because they want to open that up to the to Canadian residents. To my understanding, that's what kind of Josh and Corey explained to me. So a lot of those pools are a no go now. Um, but yeah, it was an incredible experience. It was awesome to, to connect with friends and shoot on a fun platform and, and then, yeah, I just released the little extras at it. And I think I'll continue to shoot Super 8, but it is really expensive. So I'll, I'll definitely pick out the sessions and, and when I break out the camera. 
Yeah, dude. I love the fact that you did do it with the Super 8. Um, I thought it really brought the whole project together. And I think that had it been filmed on, you know, HD or even uh, like mini DV tape, I don't know if it would have had the same feel. I really enjoyed the fact that, uh, you know, you kind of went against the grain there. Within, you know, most BMX uh, videos nowadays, it's either done on a VX and it's such a, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? It's such a, like, weird. Nostalgic yeah, or niche. I guess. For me, it's always been kind of something where I don't mind the VX and I actually used to use a, a DVX and I had a Canon GL1. Those were my first real video cameras. But for me... I've kind of looked at it as like, and I know this is an opinion that most people disagree with, but nowadays all of our phones, all of our screens, everything is a rectangle. So if you're going to film a full length thing, you should really try and fill that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I understand like there's plenty of people that uh, completely disagree with me. Tony Maloof, definitely one of them. You know, We had a, a nice exchange on the show when he was on here about it. And I completely understand why people would do it. But to me, it's always just been one of those things that people get the VX because, you know, their favorite videos were done with the VX, which is awesome. But, you know, expand out, try some new stuff, man. There's always uh, room to improve. And I think nowadays, you know, 2020, we can move up to 1080p at least, you know. But when it came to this, I think that it's such a, like, you know, the way that you did it with the Super 8 was perfect like had it been done with hd i think it would have still been great even mini dv would have been great but i think yeah like i was saying the super 8 really brings it all home thank you i appreciate that the the beautiful thing about super 8 is is it's raw and it's as real as you can get because don't get me wrong i love all the the red cam and all the super high-end production values and and videos but for me that was never bmx bmx was dirty raw and real and when you're jumping into a backyard pool and you have a little super eight camera and you're just capturing the moment because that's all you have who knows if you're going to get guns drawn on you or or, or you're going to get ran out by the cops so it's you have to be pretty stealth and having a ton of gear and equipment you're you're not going to be able to make that happen and uh, the beautiful thing about super eight is you can do the over scan so you can process it at a 16 9 ratio and then show the sprockets on on the left side and then top of the the frame and below the frame and i think it's just such a cool look and a lot of music videos are actually going that route is using and splicing some super 8 footage and and i'm such a, a dork for that stuff i absolutely love old super 8 cameras and film stock and and uh just the feeling of pulling that trigger is 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 a rush and it's i'm, I'm stoked that i was able to do it yeah, definitely. And uh, something I want to clarify, you know, I definitely don't think that we need to be doing like crazy 8K red camera stuff all the time. I think there's a time and place, right? Like when we look at Christian McGall and some of these oh, yeah. uh, filmers that have kind of earned that, it works really well. You know, um, those dudes just know what they're doing when it comes to it and they make it look so good. Whereas, uh, you know, the average filmer just isn't going to make that happen. Um, but yeah, I definitely... Uh, yeah, the Super 8 was such a great idea for it. Good on you. Um, and what I wanted to say also is that, you know, with the commonplace in like BMX uh, video editing and the way that videos are done now, everybody kind of follows the same formula, you know? And what I love about this video is the fact that it's not really a BMX video. It's not highlighting BMX. It's highlighting pools, you know? And I think that really brings it all home. And the music you chose was so good, like... You know, it was honestly the perfect, uh, everything was done so well. You can see that you put a lot into it. Rad, thank you. Yeah, I was super lucky to be able to collaborate with all the bands in, in the video. Um, I'm such a, a music buff. I just absolutely love music. And I love when I get to connect and collaborate with friends of mine that, that do play music. So we clear, I cleared all the music in that video because I want to give some shine time to some of my friends and people that are making really great music. And at the same time too, with film, film festivals, if you're using a, a song from the Beatles, it's like, yeah, that's great. But it's like, you didn't get it cleared. You didn't connect and it doesn't have a sense of community. So that's the neat thing about what we do is we get to connect with people on so many different platforms. If it's a graphic designer doing 
your logos or if you have a buddy that's a musician or or even the cold stuff i really admire what vish is doing he makes his own music like that's incredible and even guys like adam batten he's made his own music and rick it's it's really awesome because it's like we're given so many different platforms to utilize might as well maximize it and build relationships so i was lucky enough to partner up with the dirty fences and then um burns's band with alby and lamont and then Jenny Don't, the Spurs, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really stoked to connect with music that I already listened to on my end on my own. So I'm, I'm glad that it, I, I went the route that I did. Yeah, I think uh, like you know you were saying, it's so interesting to actually have to go and get the licensing for things. Like with my BMX DVDs, um, my most recent one, Space Goats, I have a very close friend who uh, used to produce more like electronic music. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Justice, but they're a, they're a pretty big like electronic music duo, and he really was inspired by them. So it's not like super repetitive or anything like that. There's actually a lot of hidden elements and uh, there's a lot that goes into the music that he was making. But he's in a like a more of a hardcore band now and that kind of stuff. And um, the music worked so good with the way that I was editing the video that uh, I had him, you know, give me three of the songs that he was going to be putting out on an EP and we use those for the video and it worked so well. And then everything else I didn't get cleared, but uh yeah, at the same time, I think it was more of a small project. I've kind of always been interested in trying to get um, things cleared. But when it comes to more popular songs, it's almost impossible, right? Like, there's so much that has to go into it. And yeah, that's the beautiful thing about what we do is in a lot of ways, we're inspired by music. I don't play any instruments whatsoever, but I am so inspired. I'm more inspired by going to a live show than I am watching most BMX videos and nothing to hate on them. But I'm artistically in a space that I can visualize my own my own ways of of creating and bike riding and art and and in general. So I use it as a huge platform of inspiration. And lucky enough, living in Portland, we're we're able to watch so many awesome live bands. And like I was mentioning when I was freelancing with ESPN, was I had to clear all that music during that time. And uh, I would just go to live shows and check out some of the local bands and be like, "You guys are awesome. You guys rip. Is there any way I could use some of your music?" For this project and nine times out of 10, they were way into it. And that's led to some really great opportunities and relationships. And, uh, and then years later, I ended up working on the hunt with Justin Cosman, which was an international BMX video uh, competition. And we had to clear all the music. So I was um, in charge of, I was project managing and then I was media management, managing all the files and videos and collaborating and connecting with the filmers and writers. And, and that was awesome because we had to create um, uh, all cleared music library for these writers. And, and I would have to seek out music that I didn't know a whole lot about. And then we would get suggestions and then some writers made their own music. And it's pretty exciting to, to, to work and collaborate with musicians for, for projects like your video and, and projects I've been a part of. Yeah, you had mentioned uh, Cult there earlier with Vish, and that is what I love about Cult, you know, is the fact that they've kind of really made their own independent thing the last few years. Like, Vish is just such a great addition to them. And when I had Rabo on the show, we talked about, you know, how important it is that, like, what Vish does for them, you know? And I think that yeah. having somebody that's able to do that is incredible because I really wanted to. I would have loved to make all the music for my videos that I've done, but there was just no way. I'm not musically talented. I'm not anything like that. But yeah, like you, I get so inspired by live shows. Like this whole year has been so hard for me because this is the first time in like, you know, the last five years at least that I haven't been able to go and see a live show at least once every two months. You know, there was a week back in 2019 where I went to a show every single night, which is incredible, right? Like that's so hard to do and manage, but uh, it was, it was amazing. It was seriously, I love going to live music. It's one of my favorite things ever. Um, and yeah, it's just been really rough. You know, the last show I went to was in February. That is the longest time since like way long ago. Yeah, I agree. When I lived in Austin, Texas, and 
I would work South by Southwest and with transmission events and fun, fun, fun fest, I was going to shows three, four days, five days a week. And it was incredible. It was just nonstop. And you meet so many people through music and at shows and work in festivals and events. And, and, and that's what makes Austin a beautiful place. But now with COVID it's kind of changed things a bit. And I, I hope we can get back to where we were or at least close to it. Yeah, definitely. What I love uh, about shows too, because you had just mentioned it, you do meet a lot of people. And when you're into like obscure music, like I am, I love ska and ska punk. That's my life, man. I love that stuff. Um, there's this dude, Dino, who is from Toronto, and I have seen him at so many shows. And it's one of those things that like, we don't really know each other, but we always end up going to the same shows as each other. You know, like we uh, we went to a music festival in Montreal a few years ago and it was just me and my girlfriend. We went there and we show up and sure enough, him and his girlfriend are there, too. And it's one of those things where we didn't plan it. We didn't really talk about it or anything. And to be honest, I've never really talked to the guy. We just always end up at the same shows together. Um, But, yeah, I think that's so cool about like music. Right. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a sense of community and just live events in general, if it's sports, it's, if it's music, it, it, it's very genuine, raw and real. And I think that's probably why BMXers are so drawn to it and the energy too. Yeah, definitely. Um, something that I'm actually kind of looking into right now, but for the future, and I'm hoping that we can do this in the spring, I really want to do a live podcast and have like an audience there. I think that would be so much fun. But uh, yeah, with everything going on right now, it's kind of like, what's the point in even trying because it's not possible at the moment, right? Until things kind of settle down with COVID, I can't really do anything with that. Um, And there's no offense to anybody that has been doing the live shows where it's through, you know, Facebook and it's done live like that. But that's kind of, you know, not what I'm looking for. I'm really looking to try and have an audience and do it live. So yeah, for you listeners, let me know what city you live in and uh, maybe we'll make something happen. (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's great you have the time and the resources to really think about what that might look like and what platforms you can release that it's it just like when you live in these northern states or, or in canada you have harsh winters and it gives us time to to look for pools online or create podcasts or events and it's it's great to have creative outlet out outlets that keep you going during the dark season definitely um Moving back to pool service announcement. So uh, there's actually quite a few legends and uh, great riders in there. So right off the bat, Rick Thorne, um, you know, huge legend. He actually just released a print uh, that's signed by him and Tony Hawk of him airing over Tony Hawk. I bought that shit instantly. So I have one coming to my house. Um, And you know what? You guys should too. Go and buy one of those. Support BMX. Um, But then Mike Escamilla, Corey Walsh. uh, What was it like? filming with all of these guys for this project. Yeah, it was great. Most of us all are are pretty tight and we ride quite a bit. Um, So I get to California at least once to twice a year. And sometimes Andrew and Rooftop will come up this way. And so I've been riding with these guys for a number of years now. And so it's just very organic for us. And it was just, it, it was just an addition pulling out the super eight camera. So nothing felt forced by any means working with those guys and, and shooting. And it's not even working. It's just, we're, we're documenting and having fun and the camera is just an addition to it. So it was incredible. I love those guys and, and riding with them. And I look forward to spring and summer when I'm healed up and I get to go down there again and, and ride with them some more. And we'll see if I shoot more super eight, but I think it's something that will happen organically because I, I try and be very natural as far as some of these projects go. Yeah, definitely. We're just about to watch some of the footage of those guys here. Yeah, there's Rooftop there. Rooftop is such a legend. I love him, man. He's so good on a bike, which is crazy too, right? Like, he, uh, yeah, he can ride anything, which is awesome. Yeah, he's an incredible rider. He's been doing it for a long time, and. And all those street kids out there, you know, I, I feel like we all owe thanks to Rooftop because he kind of opened up the doors as far as what he has done on a bike. It, it's insane the amount of energy that guy has and devotion that he puts. He's probably one of the hardest riding street riders um, that's still going at it at his age and and being able to ride pools and street. It's, it's inspiring. I, I'm inspired 
by my friends, which is a, a very special thing. Yeah, definitely. One of the biggest regrets that I have is that I had Rooftop on as one of my first big guests. I think it was either episode 17 or 18, but I was not prepared for it. You know, I was so nervous, so intimidated, and uh, I just feel like I did such a terrible job. So maybe one of these days I'll hit him up and kind of explain my situation there and, you know, offer to do it again and see how it goes. But uh I've had people say that they liked that episode, but for me, man, it was just one of those things where I knew at the end of it, I was like, fuck, I did not do a good job at this. I tried, you know, that's all that matters, but I just, it didn't seem right. Um, yeah, and that's yeah. how it goes. You know, sometimes that's, that's life. That's a video project or that's whatever you're working on. Sometimes it doesn't turn out the way you want it and you're able to learn and evaluate and grow from that experience. Yeah, I just felt like, uh, you know, he was so great, like so patient with me and everything. But at the time, I just feel like I just didn't know my format enough. I didn't really have the things that I do now. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe one of these days we'll try and get him back on and do another episode. Um, but anyways, you know, you had entered PSA into uh, the Oregon Short Film Festival and it won Best Micro Documentary. So first of all, that's incredible. I love when we can see... You know, people branch out into other industries and see how that, you know, is really successful. Um, how are these films judged? Do you know? To tell you the truth, I'm not entirely sure. I know they have a panel and a jury that goes through the films and then they they judge based on on um, the selections and based on the categories. Uh, that film festival, I think they had three or four people on the jury and uh I guess they liked my film and it probably stood out because it was um, probably, I think it was one of the only film projects that was actually shot on actual film, Super 8 or 16. And uh, it was awesome. It was a great experience because during COVID, a lot of these festivals, this film's got gotten into a number of festivals, but it, they had to um, adapt to virtual screenings. And, and this was actually one of the only festivals that did an actual event and it was at a drive-in movie theater in uh, the Dallas, Oregon at an old mill uh, that is also uh, a winery. And it was incredible. It was so cool. We're right on um, the railroad tracks and they projected it up on, on the, um, the mill and uh, they had a big screen and everyone was parked out on their sit on their tailgates or in their vehicles. And uh, that was an awesome experience. So I'm so glad to experience that. And then, and then they did a similar format too in Austin, Texas for the Austin short film festival. And, uh, they had a drive-in style movie, movie showing. And yeah, I think it's great. I think anyone that's a creative should see what platforms they can release their, their projects on because seeing your project on a big screen is, is really exciting. And, uh, I think anyone that's is, is a diehard, uh, skate filmer, bike filmer, or anyone in general, that, that feeling's pretty incredible. And there's nothing that can really even relate to it yeah exactly and uh like you said you know having it shown on a big screen with a bunch of people is the best feeling right like when we did the premiere for space goats that was by far one of the best nights of my life you know all of the hard work over the course of three years and you know everything that we went through was worth it for that one night you know those two hours that it was on and people were there and uh you know, I think it must have been a similar thing for you, definitely. And I think it would have been really interesting to see, you know, who knows, maybe a few years from now, you'll meet some kid that was there with his parents and uh, was completely inspired by all of that and has started riding, you know? Yeah, that'd be great. Who knows? And it's neat because when you get to release videos in that platform, it's a non BMX skate environment. Usually when we go to these BMX events, we know you know, 80, 90% of the people there. But when you go and, and you, you don't know anyone in the audience, it's pretty exciting to tell you the truth. I really enjoy that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's like, you know, there must've been people cheering and they were probably pretty stoked after that. Cause it is so good, honestly. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, anyways, we'll move on to, uh, your book here. So you won't is a hundred pools written by you, Dean Dickinson. Um, and, you know, like you had kind of mentioned, this has started out with the uh, low tech documentary you guys did, which was uh, Take It or Leave It. Um, 
and this is such a cool idea, man. Like you don't really see books when it comes to BMX stuff very often. Um, and I think that was so rad. I haven't, bu- I haven't got a copy yet, but I am 100% going to buy a copy because that needs to be in this office for sure. So, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you kind of got started with that project and where it kind of went. Yeah, it was an incredible experience. I had such an awesome team to back me, but I guess from the beginning, it came from shooting photos while we were filming Take It or Leave It. And I had a ton of extra photos and I was like, you know, I should make a scrapbook or I should put this in some sort of form. And then as the project started to gain momentum, I got Mark Lumen on board, Jared Sowney, Ryan Davis, Mike Daly, and then towards the end, Justin Gosman really helped get it actually um, out there. And uh, it was incredible um, pushing yourself in a creative platform that you're not used to. I had written 175 pages and we had to edit it down to, you know, 90 pages. And that was interviews and pulled quotes and, and just some of the editorial process. And I had never written that much in my entire life. And I enjoy writing, but I have to be in, in the space. And actually during that time, I broke my ankle. And so I had a lot of time laid up. And so I would have my leg elevated sitting at my desk and just writing away and, and telling these stories. And um, I feel like all the stars aligned. And, and it took some time to, to do it because these projects are not cheap and um, just formatting everything. And we we're lucky enough to have Mark Lumen as our project manager. And then my editor was uh, Mike Daly, and he used to work for Go uh, Magazine and has done an incredible work. And so I kind of had the dream team back in me and supporting me with this project. And then towards the end, Justin Cosman got it funded. As someone who has rode over a hundred different pools, um, what was it like to ride the nude bull, which is kind of like the most famous pool in skateboarding, BMX, you know, action sports, really? Yeah, it was a trip. Uh, so I guess long story short, I saw a photo that leaked online, um, on, on Instagram, this, I I won't say any names, but, uh, anyway, the guy posted a photo and I reached out to a friend that is a, a a pretty well-known skateboarder. And, uh, I asked him, I was like, Hey, what's going on? I just saw this photo. And he's like, yeah, so-and-so blew it. Uh, we're here right now. Please don't tell anyone. Um, so right then and there, I got on the phone and I called Jason ends. I was like, Hey, um, I'm going to give you some news, but you can't tell anyone. And he was like, yeah, what's up? And I was like, nude bull just got dug out, um, recently and let's make it happen. So I was living in Austin, Texas at the time being, and, uh, bought a plane ticket and went out there. And I think we might've been some of the first BMXers. I think some local kids kind of knew about it and went up there and wrote it. But, uh, me, Jason ends and Keith Mulligan went up there for the first time. And it was incredible. That's one of the most famous pools, uh, in the world. And I think it's been going since about 1980. And I know the Santa Cruz Salva have been skating that for, for decades and it's been filled in, it's been shot up and it's gone through some blood, sweat and tears. And it was pretty incredible. It's crazy because when we went there, I guess, I thought the pool was going to be so much more mellower. It's actually pretty steep. It's pretty gnarly because you'd see photos of Jay Miron doing 540s or Brian Blyther airing six feet, uh, Matt Hoffman or Ron Wilkerson. Those guys completely destroyed that pool. And that thing really was pretty gnarly. And they're riding some of the worst bikes you could ever imagine for that time being and that era. So uh, it was pretty awesome to, to see that all happening and, and to go back there and, and ride was incredible. And uh, I think I've been up there three other times since then, shot some photos and, and rode and filmed. And uh, yeah, it was a nudist colony for a number of years. And then that place burned down and then it, the, the pool is vacant. And now they've built some DIY stuff up on the hill. And that was an awesome experience. Yeah, what I love about the nude bull is the fact that, uh, you know, like you kind of mentioned there, for people who are unaware, um, yeah, it was a nudist colony first, and then the place burned down, the pool was still there. However, um, the police had come and, you know, filled that pool with uh, dirt to try and stop people from going there because there was such a high rate of violence and weapons, I guess, uh, there at a certain time. Um, At least that's what I had read up on. Um, and then the skaters and the rest of the community came and dug it out. And then the cops came back and pushed more dirt and, uh, you know, really tried to 
damage it so people couldn't come back. And again, you know, they came back and they fixed it. And uh, from what I've heard, it's still there to this day. Just, you know, the same old nude bowl. And it's crazy to think that like so many people put in time and effort just to dig that thing out, you know, and uh, just so people could ride it. And it is like, if you know where it is, it's in the middle of nowhere. Like it makes zero sense for the cops to come all the way over there to shut that thing down. You know, like um, I was able to find it on Google Maps pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, it's an incredible spot. It's one of my dreams that I will definitely ride there one day. Yeah, I feel like any lifer needs to go to Baldy and the Nude Bowl. And uh, since they're both still there, you, you got to seek it out because any lifer BMXer does need to experience that. Even if you're not into pools, I think you can appreciate the spot for what it is. Yeah, it's a uh, it's such an incredible spot. Anytime that you see photos from there, like it's just so wild to think that all around you is a fucking desert. You know, there's nothing there, and then all of a sudden, there's just this thing right in the middle of the ground there. Yeah, I agree. It's a trip. You know, that's what makes it so incredible uh one of the times i went up there was with dirt ron and jeremy pavia and uh we camped out and we slept in the pool and when you're that far away from the city you can see every star and uh laying in the deep end just staring up and we had a fire going and i i, I think we made hot dogs or whatever and it was just incredible experience and then waking up and then riding it the next day uh was was a pretty incredible experience Hell yeah, man. Cowboy Dean likes his hot dogs. We all know that. <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, to go back onto your book here, how hard was it to find a publisher? I feel like that would be kind of the most, you know, pain uh, thing. But at least with the project that you had, it's such a unique and cool thing that I think a lot of people would be into it. Yeah, the tough thing about a project is there's layers of of work that has to be done and and you have these goals and sometimes it takes time. And at that point I was lucky enough, we were working on the book and um, I can't even remember if uh, Jared was still working on it or not, but um, we we're at a point to where we had had a lot of work done, but um, we didn't know how we were going to fund it because anything print is so expensive. I don't even want to go into the dollar amount. And uh, I was lucky enough to get a phone call from Justin Cosman. He's like, Hey, I, I knew that you were working on this book. I think ESPN had done a little interview with me at that point. And he was like, how do we make this happen? How, how can I help? And uh, I kind of told them where we were at. And so he pitched the the project to the vans and ProTech and then S and M. And then he, put some money into it. I put in some money and collectively enough, we were able to make it happen. So we didn't have a traditional publisher. Uh, we just had it funded through our uh, incredible sponsors that helped make it happen. And, uh, and then we had Ryan, Ryan Davis was our designer. He's originally from, Oh gosh, he's from Canada. I'm just trying to draw, I'm drawing a blank what town he's from. Um, Anyway, he's a Canadian BMXer. He he did all the boycott stuff. I don't know if you're familiar with boycott at all, but uh, anyway, incredible designer. And and then we had a place in Portland that did the printing, and and we were able to make it happen. We did 150 exclusive copies. I gave out most of those copies because we had so many contributors that really helped with the book. And then from there, we released it on uh, Blurb.com. It's a print-on-demand company to where you purchase a book and then they they make the book it's not like you have mass production and then you distribute from there so it is a little bit more expensive but the binding and the print quality is so top notch i'm really happy with uh the blurb um version of the book and and getting that going so yeah it it was an incredible experience it took a, a lot of blood sweat and tears into that project and there were points for where i was like i don't know if this is going to work out or not and luckily, luckily enough, I think Justin Cosman really helped make it happen. So shout out to Justin. Hell yeah, man. That's so rad. Um, I'm definitely going to buy one, you know, and uh, I think what we're going to have to do is I'm going to have to buy one and ship it to your house because it needs to be signed. That's a must. You know, I want it to end up here in the studio signed and everything. Um, but yeah, I definitely, you know, I did notice that it is quite expensive, but I mean, it's a good quality book, man. There's a lot of, uh, you know, work that went into that. And I'm fully willing to pay every fucking dollar because you earned it. Like that is such a wild, um, 
you know, form of art to see in uh, BMX, and I love it. It's so like non traditional. You know what I mean? Yeah, I appreciate that. A lot of work went into it. We've had so many incredible creatives that shot photos. You know, we have Jeff C, we have Rob Delecki, and then you know Mark Lumen wrote Matt Hoffman's book, and he is uh, our project manager for the project, and Jared Sony had worked for Ride BMX magazine for a number of years and shot of some of the most iconic BMX photos of all time. And then Mike Daly of, of Go and then Ryan Davis of Boycott. And it's just collectively. And then we have some of the best pool riders on the planet that are that are documented in that project. So obviously, yeah, I'm you know, that's my sales pitch. But at the same even with me completely disattached from the project, there's so much that had pure raw creativity had gone into into that project if it was the photos or some of the stories told and so i think it's definitely a worth worth purchasing and reading absolutely um so you know looking back at all the pools that you guys traveled to and everything you did for the actual project um what was uh was there any moments that you actually had to go back to a certain pool because you didn't get a photo of it or anything like that yeah. So in the beginning for when I first started riding pools, I really didn't shoot photos. It was all filming. I had my VX 2000 with me all the time. And, uh, I had to go back to some of the pools or reach out to, uh, contributing photographers to see if they were interested in donating some photos. We had a ton of contributing photographers. I would say, I think over 30 photographers and then, you know, probably 50 riders. And then, and then people that just help fact check and tell stories and, uh, yeah, so I would say the first, I don't know, maybe first 30 pools, I really didn't have a whole lot of photos of. So I had to reach out to people that I I did know that shot some photos. And then I had to go back and shoot some photos as well. And uh, that was exciting. And actually, now I'm currently working on another book. And this is going to be 500 pools. Um, so you want 500 pools written by Dean Dickinson and friends because there's a ton of people that have contributed to this. And I just want to bring along my friends for the ride. And, uh, currently I'm at around 375 and my goal is to ride, um, 500 by the time I'm 40. So I'm 35 right now. Um, and this last summer I rode 30 pools. So I'm hoping to, to reach around that number, but that is quite a few, you know, if you do the math as far as cleaning out and, and riding a new pool, not something that you've already ridden before, but seeking out something new. And so I'm looking forward to this next project. Hell yeah, man. That is so cool to hear about. Honestly, I love the fact that you're, you know, stepping it up and going to 500 and making a sequel of this. And, uh, you know, when it comes out, I'll be one of the first to buy it. That's for sure. You know? Um, yeah, it's so rad, man. I love the fact that, uh, you know, you're really putting in the effort here and really going for it. And I think, you know, with you selling through blurb, that's honestly probably the best way to do it right now with print on demand stuff. Everybody's doing that. Like if I could with shirts, I would definitely do it, but, uh, you know, I can't at the moment. So one day though. Yeah. And that's, what's great is there's so many different platforms to express your creativity. If it's a online book or if it's print on demand or a little zine or screen printing or, or, or uh, stencils on your t-shirts. There's just so many different avenues to express yourself and, and bring the community together. And, and, and that's my biggest thing is I just want to preserve some of these photos and stories. Cause I have so many awesome photos of my friends that I want to be able to document, look back because I know I'm not going to live forever. And I want to pass this down to my family and, and everything else because backyard pools, a hundred years from now, rideable backyard pools probably won't even exist. So in a lot of ways, I want to preserve what we do and what we ride because it's, it's not always going to be there. Absolutely. That's such a great reason for it too, you know? Um, anyways, uh, I would love to move on to some video parts that you've filmed over the years. So, uh, yeah, first one that comes to mind is your most recent part, which was too fast for food with bone death. Um, and there's a few clips in there that are just so cool. You know, one of them, uh, right off the bat is your diving board drop in, which is such a scary thing to think about, especially when you really think about how a diving board works, right? Like as you're going towards the end of it, it's going to start flexing down. So, uh, what gave you the idea to try that? And was that the first time you had dropped in off a diving board? Yeah, that was the first time I right away. I saw the setup, um, 
I approach pool riding just like street riding. You're always looking for setups and something unique and different. And don't get me wrong, I love riding the traditional kidneys with just the the traditional setups, but I'm constantly looking for something new and unique to do. And right when we went there, I saw and I took a slam right before that, so I was pretty sore during that session, so I think I was mostly taking photos during that time and then as we were starting to pack up, I just got on the diving board and just felt things out. And uh, it took a little time because it's just, it's pretty much just a half crank. And then as I go off to the edge, you can see my front tire just barely drop for a second because you feel the compression and it's, it's a weird setup. It's, it, I've never done anything like that. I didn't know what to expect. And I think I took a slam before that. And then I was able to make, make it work out. And uh, neat thing about Arizona is there's so many cool setups as far as pools and wacky, wacky setups. And, and that's my biggest thing with pool riding really yeah it's such a wild clip and uh we're re-watching it here it looks like there was something underneath the diving board uh further up to try and keep it stable let me see here yeah because some of those diving boards especially in arizona it gets so hot and dry that you'll stand on a diving board and it'll it'll shatter like fiberglass and so you have to be kind of careful you can't just be bouncing around on a diving board. I've seen it a ton of times where people are like, oh, I wonder if this is going to work and just snap diving Jesus, boards the first thing yeah. to go. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you guys had uh, cinder blocks or something kind of stacked underneath it, and it still flexes when you get to the end, which is so scary to think about. I really just wanted to know your ender for the dirty sniff. You know, it's such a crazy trick that you were – able to pull off with the drop in off the roof into the pool. So when did you first lay eyes on that setup? Yeah. Uh, so actually right when I moved to Austin, Texas, I found that hotel, uh, during that time I was project managing Texas toast in 2013 and we were looking at potential sites to host the event. And I drove by the Capitol Inn, which was right off of I 35. And I saw this big, huge square pool with tons of just dirty, um, mucky water. And I remember looking at it, I was like, wow, this thing looks pretty awesome. I wonder if this pool will ever be rideable. At the time, the hotel was running. And uh, fast forward, maybe a year, maybe two years later, uh, I saw that the hotel was completely vacant and empty. And so I, I told some of my skater friends about it. And I was like, hey, let's get your guys' pump in here and let's pump this thing out. And uh, the funny thing was, is I was actually getting ready to go out to the nude bowl and I was just running some errands because I was jumping on a plane to go meet up with Jason Enns and Keith Mulligan. And I drove by and uh, I saw my buddy cleaning out the pool. So I was like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. And so then I helped him and uh, we had our first session at the pool, drained it from the top up and we were just blasting out the water with the, the trash pump and the water was just spraying into the freeway. And it was insane. I'm, I'm, I'm blown away that we didn't even get busted. And so uh, we had an awesome session and everything was great. And actually, to rewind, now that I think about it, when we first look at that pool around the first time, I was there with Burns and uh, my buddy Kurt um, Petersel, and um, we we're looking at the pool, and and Kurt and I kind of were looking at the roof and just kind of laughing about the the possibility because the tranny looked so good underneath the water, and uh, that was just kind of a thought. It wasn't necessarily the setup did look doable even with the water in there but you never know until you take the water out. And uh, that first session when we took the water out, I was like, damn, this is actually doable, which is terrifying. But um, I think I think it could be done. And so Burns and I had kind of talked about the idea and he obviously wanted to help film for it. And our buddy Leo uh, wanted to shoot a photo of it and just kind of eyed up this, the, the setup. And I'd even go there at night and I would sit up on the roof, just kind of visualizing it and just trying to get acquainted with the setup and, and, and the landing and everything else. And, uh, long story short, um, when I was working for the school district in Austin, Texas at the Rosedale school, they hosted, a, an annual charity ride, bicycle ride, and all the funds go towards the school. And we had an incredible event and it was a box jump uh, show put on together by uh, Morgan Wade and Brian Hunt and a couple other guys. And we had such an incredible day raising money for the kids um, at the Rosedale School. I, I was just like, okay, today's the day. Let's let's make it happen because I was on such a high um, advocating for for that school and the kids. And so we went to the pool right at sundown. Uh, Leo set up his camera gear. Burns got in his spot and. Um, it's tough because the, the roof is so short 
the, the takeoff. So I had to sit kind of in a sprocket setting and then roll down the roof and drop in. So that was pretty nerve wracking because I, I only had about a half crank to even adjust and get in that position. And it's the worst place to be when you're not fully um, upright on your bike. And as I was kind of visualizing and getting set up on the roof, um, this big, huge motorcycle group uh, were working on their bikes just outside of the hotel. And then eventually they saw me and saw what I was doing and they started kind of cheering me on and I could hear some of their comments. I was like, oh, great. Like now I have a whole audience. And when you're up on a roof, you never want to feel like you're on the spotlight. But then I was just able to take a deep breath and those guys were um, encourage me and, you know, first go, it, it worked out. And I was just so lucky for, for that to happen. Cause it, that was honestly a dream setup for me. I I'd always knew that it was possible, but just finding the setup, it's, it's not very often that you find a pool, um, with a roof right next to it and with enough run up to make that happen. Uh, so shout out to, to Burns and, and Leo for shooting the photo and, and ride for running the photo. Yeah. It's such an incredible, um, photo and just an incredible clip, you know, like so wild to see that get done. You know, I think that that is something that we really need to see more of is people taking these big drop-ins. It's always been one of my favorite things. Like my ender for space goats was a drop-in off my buddy's roof, his two-story roof into his, uh, like five foot mini ramp in his backyard. And it's just like, it's so scary, but at the same time, it's like one of the easiest things you could do if you are confident, you know, like you're not really doing a trick into it, but it doesn't need a trick. You really don't need a trick when it comes to that. Um, but yeah, man, that clip is nuts. I love that clip. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a type of guy that has a bunch of tricks. I just like carving around and going fast and I like dropping in on, on steep pools and I felt like it was a dream setup, really. I, I couldn't have uh, asked. For, I wouldn't say a better setup. It, the roof could have been definitely better. But as far as having my friends there and the the, the Capital Inn pool, anyone that ever rode that pool, it was definitely um, during its heyday of sessions were some of the best sessions I've ever had right in the middle of Austin, Texas. And and collectively, it just all worked out. And I'm, I'm really stoked. Hell yeah, man. Um, so we're getting close to two hours here. What I'd like to do now is, uh, we'll talk about Texas, uh, Texas toast, and then, uh, we'll go to our last question if that's cool. Um, yeah, that's totally fine. So back in 2013, you were put in charge of the biggest BMX event of the year, Texas toast jam. Uh, for those unaware, the best thing to compare Texas toast to is swamp fest. Essentially you guys are pre swamp fest. Um, you guys had an amazing DIY course, dirt jumps, uh, and, you know, there was bands that would play there, uh, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was uh, so much, man. It was like one of those events that I honestly wish we could still have to this day. And I feel like, you know, we do have Swamp Fest, which is similar. But te Texas Toast and Swamp Fest are two very different things, you know. I think that's very clear with uh, how the events are run and whatnot. Um and one of my favorite things about, and this is just such a, something that has always stuck out in my head for Texas Toast, is uh, some of the art that you guys would have on the ramps. Like uh, the white vert wall had uh, Hank from King of the Hill, and he's like, I sell Redline and Redline accessories. I don't know why, but that always stuck out in my mind, and that's how like I've always remembered Texas Toast. I remember that and all the amazing clips and whatnot you know we had jim selinski on the show and he talked about his uh downside hand plant that he did at texas toast we had the fids we talked about his 540 um and yeah that event was just so wild and you know 2013 was probably the best year for it, at least in my opinion um thank how, you yeah thank you yeah how did you get involved with uh texas toast yeah so i guess i've been friends with the odyssey guys for a number of years and they've flown me product for for quite a while and i'm really fortunate to have that relationship and have them back me and uh, i had just done a bunch of work with justin cosman I, I moved down to carlsbad california and i worked on the hunt we produced my book we worked the x games we we're producing espn content and so we did quite a bit and i think he really enjoyed my worth ethic and um during that time he was having a conversation with jim bauer and jim bauer was saying hey we're going to be doing texas toast again and we're looking for someone to project manage it. And I think they might have been wanting Justin to do it because Justin is such a powerhouse and probably one of the hardest working people I've ever met my entire life. 
but uh, they couldn't afford him because obviously, you know, he has a lot of value. And so he recommended me and uh, Jim Bauer got on the phone and gave me a call and talked about what that would take. And, and, you know, maybe a week or so later, I drove down to Austin, Texas and dove in debt, um, you know, head first right into Texas toast and, and making that happen. And it was such an incredible experience, but I've never worked harder in my entire life. We had 300 international uh, riders. We had three different courses. That was the dirt. We had Matt Hoffman's vert ramp. We had the gauntlet of death, the street course. And then we even had some flatland guys flat landing. Unfortunately, we were unable to have the space for the flatlanders in the, in the years before, uh, but they were still able to do their thing, which was incredible. And we had over 50 different sponsors and we had uh, three days of after parties, and that would include the Bell Helmets Art um, Helmet Art Show with three different bands playing at the Scoot Inn, and then we had the Market Zero video premiere, and then we had Nora Cup on Sunday. And uh, I'm so fortunate to have had that experience and collaborate with so many incredible builders and brands and and riders and athletes. Uh, yeah, it was incredible. It was it was a whirlwind of of uh, festivities and mayhem and and i'm stoked that it worked out and there was a couple hard slams but i'm stoked that everyone um were was able to walk away from it all um tyler fernangle took a really hard slam um aaron the the dig dish and uh one of the worst wrecks i had ever seen and i'm i'm really stoked that he was able to recover from that and then uh mike hucker clark took a slam on the vert ramp and you know in, in true hucker spirit he woke up and he was like did i get knocked out and he was like rad killer and, and then matt, <laughs> matt hoffman was mc during it all and tim kerr was there from the big boys and doing art all over the ramps and 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 that's taj's brainchild and i'm so fortunate to have the trust you know odyssey let me live in their office i lived in the back space and they they let me drive the van and they let me run a lot of the budgeting and, and work with ryan corrigan and it really took a village i i I can't thank enough all of our volunteers and sponsors and brands that came together to make that event because I, um, I, I'm just very fortunate for all those opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. The event is nuts. We're watching some of the footage here. Um, and what's so crazy about everything too, is like you said, you know, you had, you guys had so many people coming in from all over the world, right? Like, and uh, everybody kind of knows that Austin, Texas is really the BMX capital of the world, like realistically, you know, um, and to have all those dudes out there is just makes the event so crazy. But uh, you know what? They definitely owe it to you because you put a lot into that event. It's very clear. Um, but when it comes to making an event as crazy as Texas Toast, what are some of the things that you uh, have to think about when it comes to the logistics? I know you guys had to do quite the legal route in order to make it happen, you know, permits and permission and whatnot. Um, yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, I feel like there's kind of two different categories as far as events go, and that's the the legal side, you know, getting all the permits. And then there's the DIY renegade events and to do a DIY renegade event does give you the ideas of what a real production and event looks like. But once you take that step into legitimizing everything, it just opens up a, another world, a whole nother world of, um, logistics as far as making that happen. And that goes with getting the permits from the city um, sound ordinance, um, neighborhood associations, and then just funding in general. It, it takes a lot of work. But the cool thing about Austin, Texas, is they're so used to South by Southwest and all these other activations and music events happening that they have an event um, uh, department with the, the city of Austin. So they're, used to, they're, they're semi used to people doing these things, uh, which is pretty awesome. And thank, thankfully enough, Taj had already done the work for the two years before that. And I came out the year before and helped s &M with the Brian, um, Brian Foster documentary premiere, as well as building the shield the year before with Chris Moeller. Um, so I kind of had a, a, an idea of what the space looked like. I heard, heard stories through Taj and everything else. So I could kind of visualize everything, which really helped. But, um, you know, Taj really helped out and he passed off all of his, his, um, permit information and and that really made the transition a lot easier but 
it's a labor of love. Anyone that does uh, even the smallest jam or event puts in so much blood, sweat, and tears into it. And uh, I absolutely loved working with everyone. You know, there were, it was an incredible experience. But yeah, just going through the city and getting the permits and making everything legitimate and then just creating a safe space too because you're managing mayhem. You know, there's 5,000 people there and you have to think about fire hazards. And we had to have the fire marshal come in and approve of all of our, our exit points and being able to drive in an EMT or a fire truck. And so we had to consider the worst. And, and that's, that's a different setting. You know, when you're having beers and hot dogs and friends, you know, blasting a quarter pipe and that's fun. But once you take that step into making an international event with a lot of money um, being invested into it and, and riders, you know, dishing it out uh it's it's incredible but it, it's a lot of work <laughs> yeah i can only believe it man like the amount of work that i put into my events which are not you know i don't go to the city for permits i don't do any of that i just go in and do my events every year you know i spend months prepping for these i typically do street events so we'll go like spot to spot and with these i figure out routing and whatnot on where you know, we're not going to disturb the public as much. We find spots that everybody can kind of ride. Um, and, you know, obviously, like I put a lot of money into these as well. Like last year, we gave away $400 um, just to everybody. It's the way I do my jams is basically you show up and you do a trick and maybe you'll get a toonie. If you do something cool, you might get a 10. Um, yeah, it all depends on kind of how hard you ride, right? And uh, yeah, I think you know, it only blows my mind to see these huge events. I would really love to host some big event. Um, and it's going to happen one day. Like I really wanted to do a DIY jam this year, but just was not able to make it happen with everything going on. Um, maybe next year we'll find out, but, uh, yeah. yeah, when it comes to designing the course, you know, there's so many different courses, uh, throughout there. You guys had the, um, the hell track, not the hell track. What is it called? Oh my God. I'm sorry. Gauntlet, gauntlet yeah, of death. The, the gauntlet of death, um, which was incredible. It's uh, for anybody that's listening and not able to view the video. Um, basically, it's a line of an obstacle course and you got to get through everything. And uh, some of the features in there are crazy. Like the Sunday banana blows my mind. Like, I suck at tire rides. So there's no way that I'd be going up that. Um, but yeah, when it comes to these courses and whatnot, how do you guys go about uh, designing them and who kind of foots the bill on new ramps and whatnot? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess it just all kind of depends. Like Matt Hoffman's ramp, he brought that down. Uh, thankfully enough, he was able to get that on a trailer and bring that out. That was a part of his sponsorship. Uh, the dirt course was all ran by the Credence guys. You know, hats off to Matty, Clint, Nutter, Will Blunt and all the other contributing dirt builders and riders, they, we let them do what they do best. And that was an awesome experience. And then at the very end, I think we had the, the bell helmets, um, toaster. I think it, it was like a wall ride that we had at the very end. Yeah. And so the dirt space, I just let them do, I helped them dig a couple of days and I was busy running around. Um, so I kind of let them do their thing. And then as far as the street court goes, uh, we were lucky enough to have ramps that have gone through a, a number of cycle of events. And that was through project loop. And then Ryan Corgan had a bunch of stuff and we just worked with what we had and modified and created new things. And that was collaborating with different brands. If that was dig in the big dish or the, the ride BMX wall ride, that was something that I really wanted to see or the toaster that Ryan Corgan came up with. Um, so we just utilized what we had and then adapt and modified it and then tried to think and cater to some of the riders. And then the gauntlet was a collaboration between the brands, what we had already had. And then uh, we had some new ideas. So for instance, I had the team shroud uh, diving board at the very end because I just, and then we had a kiddie pool and I, a Gary Young made it through. And then right before that, we actually had a curve wall ride, a curve wall ride. And that was the setup that Gary got really close to pulling in an Odyssey video. And I always wanted to see him pull it because I think it's one of the best setups ever. I think it's in his electronical part. And so that was the very end because I, I visualized Gary going through it and he did it. And that was pretty awesome because you can, you can kind of line things up and, and hope for the best and, and kind of think of riders and who it would cater to. 
and then and see it happen. And, and you see what the years before had been done and you want to do something new and wacky and creative. And, and a lot of things were really last minute. Like for instance, uh, this like door carve thing at, um, kind of towards the back end of the Gauntlet of Death Sanctuary. My buddies over at Sanctuary, Waylon, uh, was like, hey, we want to help you guys out. Here's 500 bucks. Do whatever you want. I mean, it was awesome. And we just threw this weird little door carve thing. And, and uh, yeah, it's just a collective effort. And it, the neat thing, too, is you get to collaborate with brands and see, like, what they had released and what they were working on and, and implement that into the course and the design. And uh, it was pretty awesome. Even that vert wall, that was red line. That was flip at red line. And uh, they just kind of did their own thing. And some of the brands really took a lot of pride in creating their own. Um, for instance, Shadow and Sabrosa, they just kind of did their thing. They just came out, had their vision, and, and made it made it happen. And uh, I really appreciated that that part of the creativity. And we, the people, Chester Blacksmith, came out and did that that uh, concrete ledge. And it's awesome. It's 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 neat to collaborate and connect. You know, you have a vision, and you have an event, but then when you bring the community out, it really empowers people. And I think that's, um, the number one takeaway from Texas toast is it, it brings everyone together. You're able to put your petty differences aside and, and connect and, and make a sense of unity and community through such an awesome event. Hell yeah, man. Those events were, uh, honestly the highlights of like the BMX world back then, you know, we have quite a few events nowadays that take place every year that everybody gets really excited about. Obviously, Swamp Fest, you know, Battle of Hastings, all of these jams. And I wish that we still had uh, Texas Toasts around. But, you know, while it was here, it was definitely probably one of the most popular events in the BMX world. Um, yeah, it's great. You know, every era, things change. You look at the Roots Jams or the, the Backyard Jams or you look at Metro Jam. And it, there's just different eras, and and it's I love to see what guys are what what Trey and all those guys have been doing with Swamp Fest and make it their own. It, that's the beautiful thing about what inspiration. It's like you see what someone else does or or the years before, and you make it your own. And I, and I absolutely adore and love that because you never want to see people doing the same thing. You don't want to see people making a, a new Metro Jam. I, I think that's great, but adapt it, make your own, do your own thing. And, and that's the beautiful thing about working with creatives and do it yourself mentality of, of what BMX is all about. Hell yeah, man. Um, what's your advice to kids out there who, you know, want to make their own jam and they want to start to bring their community together? Uh, yeah, like you said, you got to build your community first. You know, if you're not a likable person, you're not going to get a whole lot of help. And, uh, it really does take a village and, and connect with your local shop, connect with your local trail builders or street riders or, or ramp builders and, and let everyone feel appreciated. And, and when you're working on a shoe string budget, you know, take the guys out for pizza or beer or sodas or coffee or whatever. Um, because when you value someone's time and their craft, it, it really gives them a sense of belonging. And so I guess that's my words of wisdom is build your scene, build your community, and then try and do a skate park jam and see how it goes or do a jam at the bike shop or, or a street ride and just kind of see where, where it goes from there. For us, we've been, I've been doing events for quite a while now. In a lot of ways, we use those events as outreach programs to, to fundraise for all of our local public skate parks. So it was a political statement, but at the same time, we were building a community with purpose. So for me, I like to do those events the most because you, you it, it's, you're not looking to make a bunch of money. You're, you're looking to fundraise for a noble cause. And, um, I guess that's my words of wisdom, build your community, build your scene, and then, and then try, a. a um, a skate park jam and connect with the local shop and bring people in and collaborate and, and network. And, and that goes a long way, but it, it definitely takes a village to make these events happen, even on the small scale. Yeah, exactly, man. That's some great advice for anybody out there who's uh, looking to do their own jam. And honestly, if you guys are interested and you want to, you know, figure out how to do it, send me a DM. I'm 100% willing to sit down and try and help you bring something together. You know, I've been doing jams for eight years. That's how I got my volunteer hours in high school. I don't know if you guys have a similar thing in the States, but 
we have to complete 40 hours of volunteer work and have it signed off. That's how I got all of mine. And I've uh, asked people in the area, you know, if you're in high school and you are into BMX, hit me up. We will work something out, you know, and you can get your hours just by helping me with the jam. Rad, good for you, man. You know, you're utilizing your resources and putting it in a direction that fulfills your your heart and your journey. And, and that's awesome. Good for you. Hell yeah. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. Um, anyways, uh, this has been awesome, Dean. Thank you so much for spending this time with us today. We have one last question before we go. Um, so yeah, as someone who has been involved with so many cool projects in the BMX world, what's your advice to people out there who want to leave a mark in BMX and give back to the community they love so much? It's a great question. Uh, have love will travel. If you have passion for, for whatever avenue that is, run with it and don't let anything get in the way of it and connect and collaborate with people and constantly have projects going. Connect and, and have a sense of community because it goes such a long way. The more people you meet, the more opportunities it can open if you, if you maintain healthy relationships. So I, I guess my words of wisdom would be build your community build your relationships. And then with that village, you can accomplish almost anything. Hell yeah, man. That's such a great answer for that. Um, like I was saying, Dean, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. We really appreciate having you here. And, uh, you know, this has been awesome. I really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah. Thanks for having me on board. It's awesome. And I, I love the podcast that you've done so far. And I, I, I'm very grateful for sitting down and learning more about you and the Canadian scene and, and everything else. So I'll definitely have to get back up, up that way, hopefully in, in the years to come. Absolutely, man. Send me a message. If you're going to be in Ontario, we might have some pools for you. Okay. I'm down. I'm totally down. Hell yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for, you know, joining us today, everybody. And we will see you in the next one. Peace. Take care. Thanks.